Hi everyone, welcome. We'll be starting in just a minute. Hi to everyone coming in. We're gonna get started in just a minute. We're just waiting for more people to join us. All right, I think uh, let's get started. So good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. Welcome to the final session of The Turn from Reactionary Populism to a Progressive Alternative with Professor Jeffrey Sachs and Roberto Mangabera Unger. My name is Shannon Coburn. I'm an education manager with the SDG Academy, and I'm excited for this session titled From Now to an Alternative, The Missing Project. Uh, in our first session two weeks ago, we learned about the history of progressivism and looked at the dynamics that are shaping global politics and economics today. And then last week, we looked at these dynamics in depth in the context of the United States and Brazil in particular. And so this week, we come to the ultimate question of well, what do we do about this and what, what is this alternative? What is our progressive alternative? Um, so I'm very excited for today's conversation. Before we get started, I just want to encourage everyone to please submit questions in the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and to also remind you that you can find recordings of this session and all the sessions in this series in our SDG Academy library, which we'll post a link to in the chat. So keep an eye out for that. So we have a lot to cover today. Let's get started. Uh, Professor Sachs, let's go over to you. Shannon, thank you very much. Uh, Roberto, uh, good morning. And to everybody, uh, thank you for joining this series and this uh, third uh, session, uh, which looks forward. Uh, we looked last week at the crisis uh, that has uh, enveloped both Brazil and the United States, but those uh, um, crises uh, that we examined uh, characterized much of the world crises of broken politics, of populism, of high and rising inequality, uh, now, of, of course, of uh, growing environmental crises, of which I would uh, add uh, our COVID-19 pandemic uh, that we're, uh, of course, uh, in the middle of uh, confronting now. Today, we want to look forward. What is a, what is a way forward to achieve uh, global goals, human objectives, uh, a progressive alternative that gets us uh, out of uh, this uh, growing uh, crisis uh, that is so widespread? And uh, as in the first uh, two talks, I will uh, show some slides. Uh, to help frame uh, my view of, of the situation. So I will uh, uh, share my screen for all of you uh, and start back at the beginning. We're looking for alternatives, uh, the way forward, and we'll illustrate the challenges in Brazil and the United States. But uh, these two countries, while they are uh, distinctive in many ways, uh, share uh, common features with 
uh, societies all over the world. So I think the discussion uh, is, is more general than the two cases that we're focusing on. I'll state uh, the goal towards mid-century, which is my frame of reference, uh, roughly to 2050, the coming 30 years, uh, perhaps one to two generations. Uh, to say that our goal, if we uh, can put it uh, succinctly, is for prosperous societies, that is societies of material well-being that are socially inclusive, uh, rather than uh, the hugely divided societies that we have today with mass inequalities of income, wealth, and opportunity, societies that are socially inclusive by gender, by race, by ethnicity, by class, and that are environmentally sustainable. Because uh, as we want to build a better future, we better uh, keep our eye on a very practical reality, which is that we are in a profound environmental crisis that must be solved if we're going to solve sustainably any other social objective. The risks from climate change, uh, loss of biodiversity, collapse of ecosystems, uh, mega pollution, uh, emerging diseases are so vast now because of the way that economic activity impinges on the Earth's ecosystems, that that is an emergency baseline for action, uh, aside from anything else that we desire. Well, I uh, like to uh, fly under the flag of sustainable development as the shorthand expression for societies that address these three objectives simultaneously, economic prosperity, social inclusion, and environmental sustainability. And I think it's worth emphasizing that the economic indicators that we typically look at, uh, GDP per capita, or even the unemployment rate, or other uh, economy-wide indicators are wholly insufficient to assess the state of sustainable development. We can have, as we do in the United States, a very high gross domestic product per person, roughly uh, $62,000 per person, one of the highest in the world. But that doesn't indicate uh, whether that uh, high material output is inclusive of uh, all of society, which in the United States it decidedly is not, uh, nor whether it is environmentally sustainable. And in the US, the production of that $62,000 per capita is uh, profoundly environmentally destructive. So the typical indicators that we use to even assess where we are socially uh, are wholly inadequate to uh, placing ourselves uh, in uh, our current situation, much less guiding society going forward. It's for that reason that we need uh, clear standards and metrics and aims. And I believe that stating aims as a sustainable development is very helpful. Uh, it's additionally helpful because these uh, ideas of sustainable development have been adopted globally uh, and, of course, uh, most recently manifested in the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, which were adopted by all of the UN nations uh, in September 2015. On the one hand, the fact that they are uh, global uh, in reach means that there is a common vocabulary that can be used to talk about objectives across society. Uh, at the same time, the fact that they were adopted by all nations, uh, I'm sure, uh, should raise the suspicion that uh, perhaps the governments didn't take all too seriously what they were adopting uh, and uh, did not view the adoption of a goal as really determining the national policies. And that's certainly been true in the US and Brazil, where uh, certainly Donald Trump never even mentioned the concept of 
the Sustainable Development Goals one time during his presidency, uh, and in Brazil, where President Bolsonaro uh, actively uh, uh, promotes uh, policies uh, inimical to the achievement of these goals. Nonetheless, uh, the goals themselves uh, are a reflection of both our needs and, I believe, of our objectives in putting together uh, objectives of economic uh, well-being, social justice, and environmental sustainability. Now, to achieve sustainable development, there are some baselines that are, I think, uh, have to be taken uh, as given uh, in view of the realities that we face. First, we must make an energy transition globally to a zero carbon energy system. That's not a nice thing to do. That's not a progressive uh, agenda or a conservative agenda, or uh, in my view, any ideological agenda. It is a simply a fact uh, of the profound danger that the world faces from climate change and the other implications of our fossil fuel dependence. Uh, in this regard, uh, incidentally, I can add that both the US and Brazil are blessed with zero carbon energy. And Brazil is actually uh, quite fortunate uh, that it has massive hydropower already deployed, uh, as well as uh, high technology uh, biofuels. Brazil could decarbonize the energy system uh, the United States has not tried uh, very hard yet, but also given our resources, uh, we could. But that's a global objective. Second, we will be living in a digital society because the uh, efficacy of digital technologies for health, for education, for commerce, for payments, uh, for every sphere of economic activity is so powerful that at least part of society has already uh, shifted uh, substantially to online activity. The drama worldwide is that only half the world today has access to the internet. So uh, we have created a massive uh, uh, divide uh, between the haves and the have nots in uh, the digital society. But I, would, I will assume that digital connectivity and then using these digital technologies for the good, for sustainable development, is a, a fundamental part of the future. I will add uh, a third uh, baseline, uh, and that is universal access to healthcare and education. Long recognized human rights, uh, long unrealized, especially in divided societies. But I would regard the ability of every child to have a healthy upbringing and one with the quality early childhood development and education as fundamental for achieving uh, all of the rest of societal objectives. Uh, I indicate uh, here that health and education are, should not be viewed as private consumption goods, but as social consumption. And in decent societies, uh, these uh, two uh, 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 investments uh, in uh, human development, and that is an individual development in the health and education of uh, each child, is viewed as a social responsibility, not as a household budgetary uh, obligation. In the United States, we don't uh, achieve that uh, even today. The only high income country uh, in the OECD that does not have universal health and education access as social consumption, but rather left to uh, the private wherewithal of households. Now, uh, each year, uh, I and uh, colleagues measure progress towards the 17 sustainable development goals. And I want to uh, show the most recent ranking, the 2020 rankings. Uh, all of the countries at the top of the list are Northern European countries, uh, uh, with uh, France uh, in, in the middle between North and Southern Europe, uh, but all of the top 10 countries, uh, in fact, are European countries. I think that that is an accurate view of quality of life in the world, where the balance of uh, 
material prosperity, uh, social inclusion, uh, limited inequality, and now increasing attention to uh, the green transition is most advanced in Europe. Interestingly, if one looks at the rankings of self-reported subjective well-being, asking people about the quality of their lives according to their own evaluation, which uh, I and colleagues report once a year in the World Happiness Report, it's essentially the same ranking of countries. Countries that rank high on the sustainable development frontier, the three interconnected objectives of material, social, and environmental well-being also rank high on self-reports of quality of life. And this is indicated uh, in this scatter diagram, which we included in last year's report. On the horizontal axis is the SDG index, which measures the current state of each of around 160 countries towards the sustainable development goals. And the vertical axis measures the self-reported or subjective well-being of uh, the populations, the average for each country. That is a question, incidentally, in which uh, people are asked if you consider life uh, as being on a ladder with 10 rungs, the lowest rung, the worst life you can imagine, and the top rung, the best life you can imagine, of these zero to 10 rungs, where is your life? And the point of this scatter diagram is that countries that are, that are achieving sustainable development are also achieving higher subjective well-being, which I take seriously as an indicator of real well-being uh, as uh, one of the best ways to know how uh, people's lives are going, and that is to ask them uh, and uh, garner the information from that. Now, I want to remind us that, uh, as I discussed last week, in order to achieve sustainable development, one needs a robust fiscal system where government is collecting 40 to 50 percent of national income and using that to provide social consumption services like universal health care, universal education, uh, social protection for the disabled, the poor, uh, people on sick leave, and so forth. And that is what Europe uh, did from the 1960s onward. It raised taxes uh, in order to provide social consumption. We've discussed this in the last two weeks. I would say it's more than compensatory transfers I want to emphasize. It's really provision of basic social goods that are essential for the quality of life. So. Brazil and the United States do not achieve sustainable development, and they share uh, at least four major uh, challenges right now. I'd say a defining common challenge, though with very distinctive national histories to be sure, is the massive inequality by race, gender, and class that both societies manifest. Both uh, the US and Brazil were long slave societies, two of the last societies in the world to end slavery. Uh, they are racially divided. Uh, gender inequality remains very high as well. Class inequality remains very high. Uh, and both countries show up uh, near the top of the world's scores on the uh, formal Gini coefficient measure of inter-household inequality. Second, both societies have a tremendous amount of violence. And this, I think, is uh, characteristic of highly unequal societies. Uh, the only way societies sustain such inequality is through violent repression. In the United States, the mass incarceration of African Americans, for example. The US tradition of gun violence was gun ownership to police runaway slaves uh, or uh, to uh, attack native uh, indigenous populations. Uh, so the incidence of violence, violence 
uh, of whites on blacks in the United States, uh, of uh, the settler population on the indigenous populations is endemic in the kind of uh, conquest societies that the US and Brazil uh, are. And uh, we both uh, in both countries face as a result, huge insecurity every day now in the United States, there's another mass shooting, uh, just another one yesterday, I think the third or the fourth in, uh, in the last uh, 10 days, perhaps, uh, they will just keep coming. Uh, and uh, the mass violence is also uh, reflected in the mass incarceration uh, of uh, poor people of color in the United States. Uh, we have relatively weak educational attainment in both countries, though much more severe in Brazil. The United States on average is average in educational attainment of high income countries, uh, but it's got a large amount of underperformance because of very weak public education systems underfinanced and reflecting the class inequalities in our society. And both countries have long neglected environmental threats, uh, especially where dominant uh, classes, agro industry in Brazil and uh, petrochemical and hydrocarbon industries in the United States have run rampant over the environment. So in terms of sustainable development, both uh, Brazil and the United States have fundamental homework to do in order to uh, make a transformation. This is basic, basic homework beyond anything else. Uh, I think that it is uh, heartening that uh, President Biden is starting clearly in that direction and uh, a huge uh, change from uh, Trump, of course, who was the worst on every one of these dimensions, uh, but with great fragility because uh, the United States political system is really divided almost half and half between a kind of white supremacist culture now pretty deeply embedded in the Republican Party uh, and an anti-environmental agenda pretty much uh, deeply embedded in the Republican Party. And so whether uh, the US is able to make decisive progress in this way is, is the current political drama. I wanna say something about quality of education in the two countries, because I think it's uh, quite distinctive. In the uh, standardized international assessments across countries carried out by uh, the OECD and what's called the PISA process, uh, the project on international uh, oh, uh, scholastic assessment, I think it is, I will come up with the exact name. Uh, the countries that score at the top uh, these days are the East Asian countries. Uh, regions of China that are part of this study, uh, that's uh, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, 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 Guangdong, uh, four, four regions, Singapore, Macau, Hong Kong, uh, Korea, all rank near the top. Uh, in this uh, standardized assessment, 500 is the average of all of the countries. So countries, uh, scoring above 500 uh, are scoring ab above the mean. Uh, and uh, you can see China topped the list in 2018 uh, in these uh, four coastal urban regions, uh, far above the rest of the world, actually. Singapore came in second, uh, Hong Kong and Macau third and, third and fourth. Uh, the United States has scored basically at the average of the high income countries around 500 in reading mathematics and science. Brazil near the bottom of the 80 countries uh, that are ranked, uh, and I don't have the standard deviation of uh, these scores, but Brazil uh, came in a, with an average score of about 400, uh, where the average is 500, and uh, Brazil ranked near uh, the bottom of the league. So I would think that, uh, quality of education uh, is uh, obviously lagging in the United States, given the wealth of this country. I think it is a reflection of the unequal access to education and the fact that a lot of education is privatized in a 
highly unequal class-based society like the United States. In Brazil, uh, this is a pervasive uh, shortfall of educational quality. Uh, I looked uh, this morning at the correlation of this PISA score, which is shown on the horizontal axis with the GDP per capita, which is shown on the vertical axis. It's surprisingly robust. Uh, there is an enormously strong correlation, positive correlation between the PISA score, in this case on mathematics for 15 year olds, and the GDP per capita in the society. Of course, causation runs in both directions, but, uh, and I won't belabor the point, but I think there's a very strong uh, correlation uh, between the uh, quality of education and the ability to innovate and the ability to access uh, uh, cutting edge technologies, now the digital economies. And similarly, uh, even more strikingly in a regression in which the, uh, uh, the horizontal axis here is the PISA math score and the vertical axis is the annual average growth rate between 1990 and uh, 2019. It's actually remarkable how strong the fit is after controlling for other standard variables. In other words, it would seem that quality of education is a decisive factor in long-term economic growth. Uh, the United States is middling and the growth is uh, nondescript. Brazil has had a, a 30 years of uh, low economic growth and instability and very poor uh, educational attainment. And I think that they are related. And the East Asian countries have had both the highest growth and outstanding uh, educational attainment. In the United States, the situation is uh, more or less uh, the following. If we look at 25 to 34 year olds, half of the United States has a high school diploma or less or some college but no degree of the 25 to 34 year olds. So 50% do not have a college degree. 50% have a college degree. Of those 10% have a community college or associate degree, typically a two year degree. Uh, about 30% uh, have a bachelor's degree and around 12% uh, have an advanced degree. This is essentially America's uh, social division at this point, and heavily its economic uh, division as well. Uh, those with a bachelor's degree or higher uh, are more or less thriving on average. Those with uh, no college degree at all uh, are in social crisis and with precarious work. And so the educational divide which also is enormously correlated across generations, households headed by college educated uh, families, uh, family heads have children who go to school. That's because of race, class, and all the other factors. Those that don't have a college degree have a very hard time uh, achieving one. So this is where the huge division is, and it's roughly 50-50 in American society. Let me finally turn to the question of the future, uh, the future of work and leisure and education for what? Uh, because we are in a period in which obviously machines are doing more. Uh, the kind of uh, work is changing rapidly uh, and it poses the question about what is the future of work? And there are dystopian and utopian visions of this the dystopian vision is that there's no work because it's uh, all replaced by machines. Uh, those who own the machines run the society. Uh, and uh, one can imagine a world in which uh, Bezos, Gates, Zuckerberg, uh, Page and Brin uh, of uh, Amazon, Microsoft uh, uh, and Google uh, already each of them with a uh, hundred billion dollars or more personal wealth uh, end up uh, dominating society and the rest of society suffers from precarious work including us uh, academics uh, because uh, machine learning is writing papers doing research 
uh, categorizing knowledge uh, with the pretty impressive uh, capacity. They read the machine reads uh, journal articles a lot faster than I do. Uh, whether it understands them or not uh, in a different way is a philosophical question, but it sure can categorize key words effectively. So the precariousness of work is real and the dystopian vision is a small uh, amount of society that owns the digital world ends up with all the wealth and the rest end up uh, in a kind of digital peonage. The utopian view uh, is equally uh, plausible and that is that smart machines do a huge amount of the, uh, the, the difficult uh, uh, work in society and leave humanity with uh, the opportunity for much more leisure uh, and much more quality engagement in our lives through work. Uh, and so in the utopian vision, humanity would end up focusing on not the heavy labor in a coal mine or in uh, a, on a farm, which already has been mechanized uh, in uh, the high income societies or on an assembly line, but in three main areas of activity, creative work, caregiving work, and artistic work, where machines can do a bit of it, but they are valued almost by definition by their human input. Uh, and so uh, humans work alongside machines in these three areas rather than being replaced by the machines. And I would argue that the utopian view would have work increasingly in these three categories, uh, human-led, digitally supported, but most work in the so-called goods producing sectors like agriculture, mining, construction, and manufacturing, uh, and warehousing and transport would be almost all by machine uh, in the future. And I think we're heading in that direction, but that's okay because these are areas of uh, huge value and uh, worth uh, and uh, esteem giving. But I think the future uh, of our time use also will change how we allocate time in our lives. More education, uh, in young years, that's a trend that's been going on for 100 years, and I think it will continue. Lifetime education will be crucial uh, as we continue to have massively disruptive technologies. Uh, adult education at all stages of life, I think, is both opportune, attractive, and necessary. Much shorter work weeks with more vacation time and leave time because leisure is one of the most important benefits of a high prosperity economy and more time for volunteer work of various kinds for caregiving work. And I just wanna end by showing what's happened to work hours over the last 150 years. They have declined substantially. As the machines have replaced work, it's not just that we went to other kinds of work, we also went to less work, which is hugely desirable in my opinion. Uh, so we went from about 3000 hours per year of work to currently about 1500 hours per year of work. And we went from, oh, maybe about 10 days of vacation time per year now to uh, between 20 and 40 days of vacation time per year. We also went from six or seven day work days to five day work days or shorter. Roughly the transition from 1870 till today was 10 hours per day of work, six days a week, 50 weeks a year or 3000 hours per year. And we're currently at about seven hours per day, five days per week and only 48 weeks per year. So we've gone down by half and in Europe, uh, even a greater decline. What's the next transition? I think we will go down to about six hours per day of work, four days per week, and perhaps 10 weeks of vacation or leave time or adult education time per year for about a thousand hours per year. This will be one of the biggest benefits of uh, the new high technology societies. 
I'll just end uh, with a, a paper that we've mentioned in the last uh, uh, two sessions. Uh, Roberto and I don't see quite eye to eye on this paper, so maybe we'll talk about it, but John Maynard Keynes predicted uh, the rise of leisure time and the challenge of what to do with that leisure time in the future. I think he's on track uh, and uh, actually described, uh, the, uh, described the challenge uh, that we will face as he wrote this in 1930. Uh, he, and he predicted that as societies become more affluent, that the love of money as a possession as distinguished from the love of money as a means to the enjoyments and reality of life will be recognized for what it is, a somewhat disgusting morbidity, one of those semi-criminal, semi-pathological propensities in which one hands over with a shudder to the specialists in mental disease. So uh, Cain said, we're gonna need a change of values, uh, less uh, money-oriented, less material-oriented, uh, I say hurrah, I hope we get there soon. So uh, let me turn it over to you, Roberto. Thank you, Jeff. The turn, uh, the theme is a progressive alternative. And my thesis is that a progressive alternative exists. Uh, it's not easy to think about it or to argue about it, because we suffer in the contemporary world from a confusion about how to discuss alternatives, which we mentioned in the very first session, and I begin by once again evoking. If I propose something that's distant from what exists, you can say that's very interesting, but it's utopian. If I propose something that's close to what exists, you can respond, that's feasible, but it's trivial. In the present climate of opinion, any proposal for transformation is likely to be dismissed as either utopian or trivial. This is a false dilemma that arises from a misunderstanding of the nature of a programmatic argument or of transformative practice. It's not about blueprints, it's about sequences, succession. It's not architecture, it's music. Because we have no credible way of thinking about structural change available to us, we fall back on a fake surrogate criterion of political realism, which is proximity to what exists. And that reliance on the false idea of political realism helps explain this dilemma that threatens to paralyze the programmatic imagination. Now, what should lie at the core of a programmatic and progressive view today? Let me describe it in the metaphor of a haven and a storm. And by this device, distinguish it from institutionally conservative social democracy. The individual agent should be made secure in a haven of safeguards against governmental and private oppression and of capability assuring economic and educational endowments. But that's only part of the task. We make the individual secure in that haven so that he can act and flourish in a world that is subject to contest, experiment, and innovation. The inherited structure of society should then be open to a storm of democratic experimentalism, requiring innovation in our political, economic, and social institutions. One thing is to have the haven as the counterpart to the storm. The other is to have the haven as a substitute for the storm. Now, that's what happened in institutionally conservative social democracy. 
its great historical achievement was a high level of investment in people and their capabilities, and a definition of safeguards against economic insecurity. But that achievement is no longer enough to assure societies, even the rich countries of the North Atlantic world, in the ability to solve their fundamental problems. The problem of sustaining economic growth when the mode of production the advanced practice of production has changed. The task of ensuring inclusion and moderating inequality in the consequence of growth. The ability to base social cohesion in something other than sameness as ethnic and cultural homogeneity erode and the need to make change possible without crisis in the double form of economic collapse or war. If there is a persistent difference between Jeff Sachs and me in these discussions, the difference lies there. I don't believe that it's enough to continue the historical legacy of institutionally conservative social democracy. It retreated in the middle of the 20th century from the attempt to reshape the economic and political institutions. And none of the fundamental problems of the contemporary societies today can be resolved or even addressed unless we reopen the terms of that social democratic compromise. So my focus is on the storm though I take it as given that the haven is also necessary. Now, the storm is to be aroused, is to be organized. It doesn't happen spontaneously. And it requires a series of agendas of change in the economic, the political, and the social institutions, as well as in the character of education. First in the economy, the market economy has no single natural and necessary form. It can take radically different forms with very different consequences for society. A way of attenuating inequality that is anchored in the practices of production and the arrangements of the economy is much more powerful than a way that simply tries to correct after the fact through progressive taxation and redistributive social entitlements, the unequalizing consequences of the economic order. We need a productivist project and we need a productivist project, a progressive approach to the supply side, not just to the demand side of the economy, at a moment in which the dilemma of development and economic growth has changed. The old road to rapid growth, conventional industry is closed, but the alternative to it, which would be an inclusive form of the new vanguard of production, the knowledge economy, seems to be inaccessible. We must break that dilemma on the second side through the arrangements that step-by-step step and piece-by-piece piece would create the conditions for a knowledge economy for the many. So then the first task is to change the relation between the backward and the advanced parts of production, to lift up the vast economic periphery where most people are condemned to some kind of make work. It begins by modest steps extending access to the resources and opportunities of production, advanced technology, advanced practice, advanced knowledge, as well as capital in favor of a larger range of economic agents, identifying what works and disseminating it. But then from those modest beginnings, we advance and begin to develop 
an alternative institutional architecture of the market economy. Between governments and firms, forms of decentralized, pluralistic, participatory, and experimentalist partnership to that goal. And among the producers, especially small and medium-sized producers and independent economic agents, cooperative competition. And then we advance further into the future and to experiment with alternative property regimes so that the market economy no longer remains fastened to a single dogmatic version of itself. This uplift of the vast economic periphery has to be accompanied by a change in the relation of labor to capital and in the relation of finance to production or the real economy. The immediate problem with respect to labor is the abandonment of an increasing part of the labor force in all the major economies of the world, rich and developing, to precarious, insecure employment. We need a new set of labor laws, a new regime to confront this reality that collective bargaining for the organized minority is no longer sufficient to establish. And then as we advance into the future, two long-term objectives. One term objective, one long-term objective is to transform the relation of the worker to the machine. The machine should do everything that we have learned how to repeat so that we, so that the worker can be the anti-machine and work with the machine to do what the machine cannot. No human being should be condemned to do work that can be done by a machine. And the other related long-term objective is gradually to replace economically dependent wage labor as the predominant form of free work. It should give way as the 19th century liberals and socialists wanted to the higher forms of free work, self-employment and cooperation. But it can give way to them only if we resolve the problem which those liberals and socialists fail to solve the problem of aggregation of resources at scale, thus the need for innovations in the property regime. Finance should not serve itself. It should be enlisted in the service of the productive agenda of society. The best way to make it less dangerous is to make it more useful. Discouraging financial activity with no colorable relation to the increase of output or the rise of productivity and multiplying the channels between the accumulated saving of society and investment, especially investment in the creation of new assets in new ways. And far into the future, the objective toward which we should work is that the major productive resources of society should not be under the control of absolute individual owners on one side or of the state on the other. They should be vested in independent entities, in trusts independently managed and accountable, and establish a kind of rotating capital auction and so that anyone who can assure those funds of the highest rate of return over time for those resources gets to use them temporarily and conditionally. Then we begin to have a democratized market order, step by step and piece by piece. The counterpart to democratizing the market is deepening democracy. All the democracies that exist in the world are flawed, low energy democracies. All of them perpetuate the rule of the living by the dead and continue to make change depend on crisis. We should want high energy democracies that diminish the dependence of transformation on trauma. The institutions that define a high energy democracy are those that elevate the temperature of politics 
the level of organized popular engagement in political life, that hasten the pace of politics by breaking impasse quickly, and that make possible an interplay between decisive initiative by central governments and radical devolution. So that under certain conditions, parts of a country can diverge from the predominant solutions and develop counter models of the national future. The third area of experimentation is in the social institutions. Civil society outside the state should be organized. A disorganized society cannot generate alternatives or act on them. And as the level of ethnic and cultural homogeneity diminishes in the contemporary societies, there has to be a basis for social cohesion different from sameness. The higher basis of social cohesion is the multiplication of forms of collective action. The many ways in which people can do things together, that's how they should unify. Now that should happen in politics, it should happen in the economy, but it should happen also outside politics and outside the economy in the internal life of civil society, in the organization of education, which should be cooperative, in the engagement of independent civil society, not for profit, in the provision of public services. The state assures everyone of a universal minimum, but then civil society joins the state in experimenting in the alternative ways of providing public services, the best way of enhancing their quality. And every citizen should have two positions in society, a position in the production system, but also a responsibility to help take care of other people outside the boundaries of the family under family selfishness at some part of his life or of his working year. The fourth area of, of innovation is education. Education is part of the haven, but it is also directly part of the storm. In countries that are large, unequal, and federal in structure, it is especially important to reconcile the local management of the schools with national standards of investment and quality. But more important yet is to innovate in the character of education, an education for agents, for rebels, for experimentalists, an education that accords priority to the analytic and synthetic capabilities of the mind that allows the young to acquire those capabilities by dealing with content, not in encyclopedic superficiality, but in selective depth. An education that is cooperative and repudiates the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism in the classroom. And above all, an education that is dialectical and approaches every subject and every method from contrasting points of view, the only way to liberate the mind. That should be the character of general education, and it should also be the character of technical education, which instead of prioritizing job-specific and machine-specific skills, the old model should accord primacy to the higher order practical and conceptual abilities required for the use of contemporary technologies. Now, how is such an alternative to be advanced? And what is the spirit that animates it? It requires in these large and complicated societies the creation of a majoritarian coalition of value creators of work and production 
a transracial coalition, a coalition that cuts across social classes and that cuts across as well the inherited divides between left and right. Such a coalition must pay special attention to overcoming the division between the organized minority of the labor force and the amorphous, insecure, disorganized majority. It must conquer the allegiance of at least part of the small business class, and it must find allies in the professional and technical cadres of society. The method of such an alternative is the method of fragmentary but cumulative structural change. It's not true that we have to choose between a revolutionary illusion of substituting one system for another and managing an established system. The way that real structural change happens is piecemeal, but it can nevertheless be revolutionary in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction under the aegis of an informing idea. What then is the idea? The central idea is an idea of agency, an idea of empowerment, approaching each individual worker and citizen as an agent to empower rather than as a beneficiary to co-opt. The higher objective of the progressives was never simply to humanize society. It was also to divinize humanity. It was to allow us to ascend to a higher form of life with greater capability, with larger intensity, with broader scope, at the core of this conception of a progressive alternative lies a message that no power or dogma or empire in the world will be able to resist. Let's become bigger together. Jeff. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for uh, many wonderful ideas. Uh, let me uh, make uh, comments in the following areas. First on the diagnosis, uh, where we share and where we disagree, uh, and then on the area of experimentation and how to, how to bring it about. On the diagnosis, uh, you put a lot of stress uh, on uh, the economic institutions as creating the divide between uh, what you call the vanguard sectors and the laggard sectors. Uh, and that uh, you see this uh, to be overcome uh, largely by uh, opening the space for new kinds of enterprise, new kinds of finance and so on. I would put the, I tend to put the divide somewhat differently in, in my thinking. First, that the divides are deeply along race and class lines as sociological phenomena more than economic institutional phenomena. Of course, both are true, but the big divisions we find in US society uh, are created not so much by the flaws in the economic institutions as by the intentionality of politics uh, and of a class-based society as well as a race-based society. What I mean by that is that a huge amount of the inequalities come not from the intrinsic barriers that uh, enterprises face as much as by the fact that people are not getting a decent education. They're not growing up in a safe neighborhood. Uh, they don't have the most basic infrastructure. And we had uh, a first a slave society, then an apartheid society, uh, and still a brutal uh, oligarchic and racist society in America 
through almost all of our history. And we're still trying to pick up the basic pieces from this. So I think that when we look at this question, uh, there's a lot of intentionality in it, not intrinsic to what's, uh, not intrinsic to the, the nature of the, the economic institutions as much as to the nature of the political economy as how they're governed, how public resources are used, whether taxes are collected or not, whether poor people are stuck into environmentally uh, dangerous environments and so on. The reason I think that this is important, this distinction, which may sound uh, you know, academic or not, is that I would put a lot of the focus on access to these empowering institutions, mainly uh, education, a safe physical environment, uh, and so forth as absolutely the most central breakthrough possible for our societies. And I think that's true for Brazil as well. If a child does not get a good education now, they're not going to make it in, in the highly experimental world, no matter how much there's a ability of new companies to form and so forth. The basic human empowerment will have been denied uh, and I think that that's a huge part of what's happening in society. And I, I emphasize that because that's how I view US politics. That's what I view the cleavages as. Will white people support uh, taxation for people of color? Uh, the answer has been no for 200 years. Uh, it's the battle that we continue to face in this country. Uh, will we have a safe environment, not only for uh, rich households uh, in comfortable neighborhoods, but from poor households living next to factories. So far, no, in the United States. So I see this as a political class and race issue to an important extent. Second, we, we really have a, uh, we really have a uh, different uh, view about the current realities of the social democracies. And, and I do want to show just quickly, if I could, a couple of pictures because I, I think it's worth emphasizing the, the social democracies, and I'm not trying to make them heavens in this regard or ideal, are not static societies. They are not uh, caught in a mid 20th century uh, web. What they've actually done, which American right wingers deny possible is they've actually created both that sphere of protection and remained technologically dynamic. And that's precisely what the right-wingers in the United States deny is possible. They say, oh yes, you know, of course the US could do that, but then we would lose our dynamism as if there's a fundamental trade-off between the dynamism and the protection uh, of individuals. Whereas I think, it, and you agree that it's the opposite, but I wanna stress that they've actually done that and so let me just show you uh, a, a picture in, in that regard. Uh, hold on, if I could. So first of all, in terms of where research and development spending is actually spent in the world, this is important. Almost all of the R&D patenting in the world is only in three parts of the world right now. North America, Northeast Asia, and uh, Northwest Europe. Uh, this is where the three zones of innovation uh, in measured as patents per capita is taking place, but this is also the vanguards of the digital world, the biotech world, where the vaccines are coming from and all the rest. Brazil is a near player in this, but is not actually, uh, except in a few exceptions. Uh, the United States is pretty good, but in Europe, Oops, the dynamic in Europe is actually hugely in the social democratic areas. This is where the patenting per capita is the highest. So these countries did not sacrifice their technological dynamism or innovation by being social democracies. They proved that you could do both. And I think that that's extremely important. In the United States context, by the way, of course, we have a huge geographical division uh, in, uh, in patenting and innovation. 
it's basically a West Coast phenomenon, a New England phenomenon, a New York City phenomenon, and a few other uh, very small areas. And this is where the income growth, the billionaires, the wealth class, the others have developed in Kendall Square in uh, Massachusetts, uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, in uh, New York City. And I think that that's important because you and I agree about the need to democratize uh, this. And then we should ask, what is it that uh, makes these agglomerations so stark? And wh what are the failures where you have a whole US South uh, that has very, very little innovation? It, the deep South doesn't show up at all. And I would argue that that is the legacy of uh, the anti-public goods racism that has characterized that region from the first days of uh, slave-based uh, society. So if one looks at where patents are being made worldwide, Denmark, Sweden, and Finland are ranking near the top of the world's list. In other words, no trade-off there. And I think I just want to underscore that, that there is something really to look at of how to combine that personal protection and the technological dynamism. On, on the second part of uh, your discussion about experimentation, uh, we agree on, uh, I think, almost uh, all of it, uh, or I agree with you on almost all of it. We're going to have that opportunity for experimentation because we're in a very dynamic, disruptive period. As long as people are well-educated, and have that empowering skill and continuing education throughout their lifetime, which I think we really should emphasize as a new phenomenon because it's not an accepted norm. Everybody should be in school basically. And there's time for that now because work weeks could be much shorter. Then I think we will see the opportunities for enormous experimentation taking place. The final point I wanna make is that we do need some clarity and cleverness in the top down and the bottom up in this because it, bottom up experimentation is essential but top down is also essential. You mentioned national rules of educational quality, for example. I would add physical infrastructure, decarbonizing the energy system, uh, clarity about sustainable development uh, and environmental sustainability is a fundamental guardrail and so on. This cannot happen merely from the bottom up, but within the context of infrastructure and global shared uh, objectives, then experimentation from the bottom up will be hugely important because we're in a very disruptive dynamic and I think, and I think you think very promising world. So, I would uh, you know, just uh, make, make those points and perhaps emphasize uh, just in closing, I think we should view education as probably the most powerful single tool that society ever has had and that it needs today. And then to think as you've stressed, what, what is the, uh, what, what is the uh, dynamic education of the 21st century and how should it be provided? Very good. So Jeff, there's a, there's a great deal there and I will make three remarks uh, in response to you. So first, we do indeed disagree in our characterization of what is happening to historic, to institutionally conservative social democracy, as I'm calling it, in the North Atlantic world, including Northern Europe. Uh, my view is that it's been hollowed out. It's retreating to the last line of defense, these high social entitlements funded by the regressive taxation of, of consumption. And the dominant project of the enlightened part of the North Atlantic elites has become to reconcile the social protection of the Europeans with the economic flexibility of the Americans. Now, the question is, is that enough? 
uh, and my claim is it's not enough. It's not enough even for them, much less for the rest of the world. And that brings me to my second remark, which is about the diagnosis. And let me try then to be as precise as possible in as short a time as possible. What are the problems which this, the, the established arrangements and this project of the enlightened elites uh, fail to resolve adequately. So there are four problems that to my mind are paramount in addition to the environmental one that you emphasize. So the first problem is it hasn't solved the problem of growth and of the rise of productivity. After the 30 glorious years following the Second World War, there is persistent slowdown in growth and in productivity. And how can that be in the midst of this revolution and of all of these patents that you've described? A fundamental reason is the hierarchical segmentation in the economy. This is a little world, the world of the minority. And that segmentation on the one hand creates slowdown and on the other hand becomes a motor of enormous inequality which little by little is overwhelming the dikes of the institutionally conservative social democracy. The third problem, which this established system cannot resolve is social cohesion. Money transfers organized by the state and universal entitlements are not enough to ensure the cohesion of a society. Money is an inadequate social cement and its inadequacy becomes manifest as the level of ethnic, cultural, religious, social homogeneity increases. The only adequate basis for the cohesion of a society is people doing things together. And in, in, in the, the change political and economic institutions and in social institutions outside the market and outside politics. The fourth problem, which this established system cannot resolve is its dependence on crisis. So look at the Europe that you so much admire. The basic rhythm of European life in the 20th century was the Europeans woke up when they were at war, slaughtering one another, and then war produced change. And then back in peace, they drowned their sorrows in consumption and went back to sleep. Uh, and so th this is the consequence of what I'm calling a low energy democracy that continues to need trauma to make transformation possible. We should be able to be awake when at peace. Now, that leads me to my third remark. Uh, whenever there is an innovation in the world, a complex of innovations, like the, the knowledge economy, it's not just a bunch of gadgets, it's a set of practices. It's a different way of doing things and of thinking. The default way of doing it is to choose that version of the innovation that least disturbs the ruling interests and the dominant preconceptions. We could call that the path of least resistance. Today's insular knowledge economy is a typical example of the path of least resistance because the potential of the transformation is radically underutilized because the form that it has taken is the form that accommodates those interests and preconceptions. So transformative thought and transformative practice exist in the world to create an alternative to the path of least resistance. The path of least resistance is always the most probable outcome, but it is never the necessary outcome. And that's why we're here. <laughs> Thank you. Let, let me uh, make a couple of quick uh, comments and then we'll uh, turn to uh, uh, some questions. Probably we agree, I'm not sure. I, I don't believe that there is a problem of innovation in the world per se, uh, or really a problem of growth. Uh, there's so much that is terribly measured, undermeasured. We, we don't even measure growth in services uh, in any adequate way. Uh, 
But I think we agree in any event, I think, that the issue is not uh, insufficient innovation if, if, if there is a problem of growth, but the way that that innovation spreads through the society. So it's more a question of uh, segmentation, diffusion, and inequality than it is in the growth dynamics. I just want to put for the record, I think we're in, a, in an unprecedentedly rapid period of innovation, highly unequal, of course, uh, diffusing uh, less rapidly. Uh, but I don't view this as a growth crisis per se of secular stagnation or anything like that. And part of the problem is measurement. We literally don't measure technical advances uh, in uh, anything but what can be weighed. So that's the physical goods sector. Uh, and part of it is this problem of, uh, of diffusion. Uh, we will uh, agree to disagree on Northern Europe and watch intensely and with the interest in the coming years, uh, because uh, I don't feel that uh, that is the case. And for Europe as a whole, which is obviously uh, a, a complex story, it's quite interesting to me that the European Union, which is very difficult uh, in intergovernmental body uh, of 27 sovereign countries, actually put on the table uh, the most progressive green deal in the world in the past two years that is real. Uh, so I feel that there's a lot to see and to learn from there. On the social cohesion side, I think your observation is great. And I would just add to it, it's people doing things together. And that's why we should shorten the work week, uh, have uh, more time for non-work activity and understand that social cohesion, which I do think exists uh, in, uh, in Northern Europe comes from eight weeks of vacation time taken together with lots of social cohesion during that period. But the observation that if money is in an adequate social cement, then we should really see structurally that non-work time, volunteerism, vacation time, leisure time, adult education time, cultural activities, are not just a nice thing, but are part of a progressive social order. And so we should take care to promote leisure and all that I'm calling leisure for exactly the purpose that you're saying. I like that idea very much. Well, let, let me stop there. Maybe Shannon uh, will come in and- uh... Yes, here I am. Good. Um... So we are going to uh, turn to some questions now. A lot of conversation happening in the Q and A. And Jeff, I'm going to take that comment about a six day, a six hour work week to heart. <laughs> um, no. I, I don't consider what we do work. <laughs> That's part of the issue. I just consider it fun. <laughs> um, so a lot of questions, a lot of different types of questions. Uh, I'm going to start off with what you were just, both of you were just saying about. Um, innovation and, and the most uh, progressive forms of production and the ideas associated with it. Um, some questions here about brain drain and uh, how our, our current system of migration and borders affects the, um, the transmission of, of these ideas and of these practices. I wonder if you could both comment on, on that. Maybe Jeff, start with you. Uh, Roberto, I think, why don't you start? Okay. No, 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 why don't you, Jeff? Uh, because um, I'm not sure that I understand the, the, the central- Well, I think one, one thing I would say is that we, we do face, a, you know, when it comes to technical innovations, uh, as I said, uh, there are only three parts of the world really uh, undertaking most of the things that reach a formal patent. Uh, they're very, it's a very concentrated world. There's a huge, here is where I, I agree, Roberto, there, there's also by design uh, a, a, system of, uh, a system of protection of the incumbents, definitely, uh, to be the ones that own the next innovation, whether it's by holdups, buyouts, uh, patent trolling, and all the rest. 
And this is what the issue with China is uh, right now, which is China's breaking into the front ranks and the United States is going to turn all its uh, military and security machinery to try to stop China from becoming an active competitor in innovation. Now, having said that, that raises an issue. What about the 5 billion people that are not part of uh, that world right now? Where is innovation going to come from? We see the implication of it. That 5 billion waits in line for the vaccines right now. That 5 billion waits in line for the 5G. That uh, 5 billion uses the social media and pl platforms designed by the other part of the world. And so breaking into the front ranks of innovation is extremely important. But then finally to the question, all of this then gets exacerbated by the fact that the engineers of the world train in those three regions and stay in those three regions. Uh, and uh, it's very hard actually, and Brazil is a good candidate for a country that could become a lead innovator, but it's not seen in recent years, even to my mind, seen that as a national objective, uh, you know, understood properly, what would that take in order to do that? Uh, so the brain drain exacerbates the concentration of technical activities in the world and divides the world strongly. And it is the purpose of the US foreign policy to stop competition in innovation in the rest of the world. That's sure. where all of the effort towards China is uh, di directed right now. So the, the significance of, the, of this, these movements of the highly educated technical elite is, is shaped in part by the degree of concentration within the countries to which they're going. If there were a much more widespread knowledge economy, the social and economic consequence of this movement would be completely different. Now, and, and, and I do wanna to return to, to the central point of the distinction between piety and transformation. So let's take the United States. Here, here we are in the United States. Uh, economically, uh, there's a tiny fringe of highly profitable businesses, such as the platform oligopolies. They're now the major businesses in the country. Uh, they have huge pools of liquid capital. Then beneath them, there are the large declining businesses struggling to remain profitable and becoming profitable by firing workers and using automation to replace rather than to enhance labor. And then there are thousands of startups with no future, zombie companies. And then there's the mass of people stuck in the vast economic periphery. That's the reality. Now, the eyes of the elite are focused on that top faction because, and there, there's a discourse that marries oligopoly to piety. So, Let's have alternatives to shareholder primacy, uh, responsible to different constituencies, social, environmental, and so forth. The managers sitting on these vast pools of capital. Then they talk about antitrust, which is very limited because it would destroy the social as well as the economic value of these inclusive networks. So is that good enough? Is this, is this marriage of piety and oligopoly the, the way to go. So it's, it is a symptom of this larger structure that we've been discussing in this, in this session. It's not enough to, 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 to sugarcoat it, to humanize it, uh, to, uh, to, to make it as it were less American and more European. There's a, a, a much more fundamental agenda of structural alternatives that are needed there and here and in the whole world. That's the basic topic in discussion today. I, I would add two, two points. One is uh, a large part of the economy, uh, probably 40 to 50% of employment today is technical work, not in these companies certainly, but in schools, uh, universities, 
hospitals, clinics, uh, social uh, areas, and so on. That's good. That's a very diverse, th those are not the mega enterprises in general. Um, and that's where a lot of the skilled part of society uh, or highly educated, well uh, recompensed part of society uh, operates. When it comes to these giants, a couple of things that I think are important to say. First, these are not uh, long time incumbents. Uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg was a, a kid down the hall from my daughter at school uh, less than 20 years ago. Uh, so he came out of nowhere, uh, made his thing and the nature of it is, uh, the nature of Facebook is uh, that there is a profound network externality, that uh, the network thrives on the network. And it's, and then of course, the, their rapacious behavior is to buy up anything that could possibly threaten uh, that network platform. So I think it's artificial, by the way, or not artificial. I think that there's actually deep explanation for why the big networks uh, have this increasing returns to scale phenomenon. They have the data, they, have, they misuse it, they do many things that I find completely distasteful, but they have created in a period of 20 years this dominant position. Yeah. It's rather specific, I would say, to the information platforms. It's not, it, it, it doesn't make it a footnote to the story because they are the dominant companies right now in the digital economy. But it's a rather specific phenomenon of the uh, digital reality. I understand that, Jeff. And my purpose was not to say that's where our attention should go. My purpose was the opposite, to say, here's this mass of people, many of them without strong links to organizations or business enterprises. Let's lift them all up. Let's, tran let's transform them into technologically equipped artisans. They will then be freer as well as more productive. This is the larger agenda. It's the agenda of the empowerment of agency. And that agenda depends on institutional transformation in every domain of social life. This might be a good place to jump in. We only have a couple more minutes. So uh, last question, both of you have discussed the power of education to bring about this transformation in various ways. Um, but I think here seeing a little bit of a chicken and egg situation where you need to educate people to think innovatively, to, to have progressive values, but you also need a system that enables that in a formal education system and other forms of education that that change the system of education so that those are the things that people are learning. So where do we start? I guess let's end on that note. Roberto. Education is a, is a project of national liberation. It's not about teaching people progressive values. It's by liberating the mind. It's by giving power to the mind, the imagination. So the mind has two sides and one side it's like a machine, it's modular and formulaic. In the other side, it's an anti-machine. That's what we call the imagination. It subsumes the actual under a range of proximate possibles, the adjacent possible. Uh, and so uh, in 1968, mysteriously all around the world, the same words appeared on walls, imagination in power. That was the, that was the task then dismissed as an inconsequential romanticism. And that is the task now. I think it's a great place to end our discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm reading uh, John Dewey, uh, yes. uh, Experience in Education. He was the leader of progressive education uh, exactly a hundred years ago, also at Columbia University. And I think uh, both uh, Roberto and I uh, concur that progressive education of the 21st century is uh, at the core of uh, this vision and this challenge. We have something that uh, John Dewey did not have. We have Zoom. Uh, we have just had a class with people all over the world. Uh, we didn't 
at least I didn't have to ask my boss about uh, doing this. And uh, I, don't, I don't suppose you did either, Roberto. I believe we can have a new kind of education uh, that is uh, a absolutely open and dynamic and global uh, and uh, uh, inclusive. We need to reach larger and larger numbers of people. But I want to say uh, that's the spirit in which uh, we have uh, discussed the turn uh, together. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you, Roberto. This is uh, the third time we've uh, taught together in a formal way. I learn an incredible amount every time, incredibly stimulating. So I want to thank you for doing that. And I hope we can look forward to the fourth time. And thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you, all of you, wherever you are. Great. Great. We've come to the end of our session. Um, it's the end of the series, but as you said, no, by no means the end of this conversation about progressive alternatives. So we hope that all of you will continue to think about and talk about these topics. Uh, once again, a reminder that you can always do that by watching the recordings of these sessions in our SDG Academy library. So we've put a link to that in the chat and you'll get one from Zoom uh, after today's session. Finally, please thank me in joining Professor Sachs and Roberto Mangambera Unger for allowing us to be part of your conversation. And we look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you.